to get started, I just wanted to uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself, because I think a lot of people know your companies, but there might be people who don't. So, um, Maddie, why don't you start? And... Yeah, sure. Um, so, Maddie Meyer, uh, IT manager of Seacom. Um, we have built a tool logistics platform on Cloud Foundry, which is run by SAP Cloud Platform. Um, and so we're here as an end user, um, representing, I guess, the small and medium-sized businesses using Cloud Foundry. Uh, Jay Piscor, Director of Platform Engineering at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, best sports company in the world. Uh, <laughs> we're a sporting goods retailer uh, based out of Pittsburgh. Uh, we've just joined the, the community recently, and uh, we're kind of changing the way we're doing our business uh, from front end to back end. Jay Schneip, I'm the director of product for Liberty Mutual Insurance. Uh, we sell insurance, and uh, we've been leveraging Cloud Foundry since 2013. All right, let's talk about why we're here. Why are you using Cloud Foundry? Because there's options. Um, Jay, you want to start? Sure. With that? We started using Cloud Foundry back in 2013 because we were um, the team that I was on was a small web. We built small web services, and when we were, you know, offered the opportunity to move to a new platform, it seemed a uh, Cloud Foundry was a much better option than our alternative is to move um, on-prem in a WAS environment that took eight weeks to build times two because we ran HA times three because we needed a dev prod and non-prod environment. Was so, that, but, sorry, but, I love interrupting. People. That's okay. Was was that your only alternative? That was our only alternative at the time. Yep. So we brought Cloud, 40, Cloud Foundry in for a fit for purpose solution for ourselves. Got it. So from the Dick Sporting Goods perspective, uh, we wanted to shift the way we were working. Um, you come up with an idea and, and there's that long process of trying to get your hardware in place and do all of that thing, the, all the things like that and the paperwork that goes along with it. And by the time you got that done, that idea could be stale and you can't get into production fast enough. Uh, we want to deliver quality apps to our athletes as fast as possible. Uh, so Cloud Foundry allowed us to, you know, kind of break down some of those barriers and put more of the productivity in our engineering uh, team's hands rather than the kind of sit and wait and get to the, the next step. Now, when I think of sporting goods stores, I don't really think about apps and data centers and Cloud Foundry. Um, what's, why? What, what, what are you trying to achieve? We want to be the best. We want to have the best overall user experience. And everyone has a phone or a piece of technology in their hand pretty much at all times, even when they're driving, which is not that great. Uh, <laughs> but when you're doing this stuff, you have to realize that people want that constant feedback, that instant feedback loop. And if you can't give that to them, they're going to go find it somewhere else. Mm. So you need to have that engagement. You need to talk about things that, that your athletes or your customers want when they're working with you. Because if you're not going to deliver it again, they're going to go somewhere else and find it somewhere else. Actually, for us, that instant feedback loop was also one of the major reasons why we switched to Cloud Foundry. We were running a bunch of apps um, on SAP Neo's cloud platform. And uh, they didn't deliver this performance and responsiveness that we had hoped for. So um, we talked to SAP, and then they suggested, well, how about you go with Cloud Foundry? Um, so we looked at that. We looked at a couple of other alternatives, like running it in um, VMware's or whatever other environments there are. Um, but then we finally decided, no, for us as a rather small company, um, it is better to go with Cloud Foundry because it is easier to use, and we don't have to worry about all the infrastructure and stuff underneath. So we really, up to this day, love the CF push and whatever goes along with it. How long did it take you to get started? Well, actually, it like the the first well newly built apps just took I don't know a couple of days to get really into the first environment, and then some more days, you know, until you've set up all the pipelines and all that. So um, after all, I would say two or three weeks till we got the very first app running, um, and then of course migrating older apps took a couple of months um, until we got a really like steady production base. And that was the first app running in production in three weeks. Yeah, it was pretty much that. Now, you've only been doing this for, for a few months, really. 11 months, yeah. 11 we're, months. We're, uh, we're, we're very new to this, but we're also very passionate about it. Um, and, and that's the thing about Cloud Foundry. The barrier to entry is very small. So you can get up and running very quickly. Uh, and I, I'm lucky. I work, I work with the, like a, a world-class group. Uh, the, the, the teammates at, at, at Dick Sporting Goods are phenomenal. And they've been so passionate about what we're doing. Uh, I mean, we've been running, I, I can't even tell you when the first app went out. I know, I know people were 
going and doing. So, I mean, we, we, were, we were clipping at a pretty aggressive rate right out of the gate. You don't know when the first app was. <laughs> out, <so. laughs> and you could probably say that's a bad thing uh, for someone who runs the platform uh, <laughs> to not know what's on the platform. But uh, it, this is what the whole point was, to, to get it out there, get it in the hands of the engineers and our product teams and our great designers and, and product managers who want to go and build something. Mm -hmm. So the first app may have been something very small, learning these processes, learning the way the change of life there at, at Exporting Goods has been. I actually want to just kind of talk a little bit about what Jay said and, you know, kind of abstracting ourselves as managers and directors from our teams and really allowing our teams to go out. And what Cloud Foundry's done is allow our teams to go out and experiment without us needing any handholding or direction. Um, and that's what's been really powerful for us is to just put it out there and let people consume it. Mm -hmm. Now, when I think of uh, insurances, I don't think of let's just put stuff into people's hands right. and play with it, right? So that's, uh... right. We've done, you know, c because we started in 2013, we've done a lot to secure it and it really enable it. So when our developers do have access to it and can go out and do it, it's in a way that it's secure, it's consumable, and it's easy to use. Is that something the rest of you found as well? That's a... Yeah, and, and that's the big piece. I mean, you want to break down those cycles of having to constantly be patching. And, and going through, you know, how long does it take me to get an environment set up? And then from there, what does the patching cycle look like? Uh, how are we securing this? Uh, when you put just standards in uh, with Cloud Foundry that you can just pop up your projects and keep moving forward, again, cutting out the overhead and just going and doing is a big thing. Um, the other interesting thing I, th I think that, I think we've said three or four times up here, uh, we don't look at people as technology companies or uh, like Liberty or Dick Sporting Goods. Um, we, I think everyone's a technology company at this point. I, I think there's just, there's just so much going on in the world that just because maybe your core pra practice may be around insurance, if you don't have the proper technology stack around it to support that, uh, you're going to lose business and clients because, because again, as I mentioned earlier, they want to be able to pull it up on their phone. They don't want to wait for the mail to come, go open that up, and then respond. Mm -hmm. So. I, I really agree. Um, for us, it was the same thing. It was kind of tedious to, to figure out, okay, how many machines do we need and what services and what databases and you know, and you have to fill out all these forms and that's, that's gone with Cloud Foundry. So it's, it's a lot easier now and the engineers can experiment. However, it was kind of difficult to figure out which services um, really to use because you have a marketplace now that's filled with so many services depending on the size of your cluster of course um, but uh, now for the engineers to choose the right service and not to overwhelm certain services is what we have found kind of a bit of a challenge. Yep. Let's talk about that for a moment the, the perspective of the developer that we haven't really talked about yet. Um, what was it like bringing, what, what did you learn in bringing developers onto the platform? Yeah, sure. So when we first um, started really expanding the usage beyond our small team into the entire development environment, we found that we couldn't, as, as, the, as the platform engineers, we couldn't guess and determine how another user or another developer would consume it. Um, and we did a lot of user research. Um, we were lucky to partner with Pivotal on that and really start to ask and understand where the blockers were for these teams. You know, as an enterprise company with almost 50,000 people and almost 5,000 IT employees, we had to use our enterprise systems like identity, like DNS, um, and some of our security tools. So we didn't have the opportunity to use things that came out of the marketplace as easily. Um, so for us, part of the developer experience wasn't just offering Cloud Foundry, it was partnering with what was traditionally siloed organizations um, to bring to bear those um, other technologies. And so for us, it's again, asking, talking, breaking down those barriers, and obviously, you know, agile methodologies have helped us a lot there um, to bring everything a developer needs end to end to deploy their application. And it's more than just Cloud Foundry, it's identity, it's their um, vanity URLs and, you know, the security that goes behind it. Sure. So from onboarding uh, early on, again, we're, we're, we're young and it's been uh, 11 months, but uh, the, I think the thing is uh, the ability to go out and kind of do whatever our engineers want to do and managing that expectation. Uh, going from they can go real time and set up 
a, an environment and start testing something that they were thinking about, and then they have all these other tools that are available to them. It's kind of managing the expectations of what is Toolset 1.0 going to be to move, to move the technology forward. Uh, you're kind of drinking from a fire hose right when you get there because usually you're, you're waiting for that long period so you can think through things, but if you can move, uh, you have to make quicker decisions. Hmm. You, you, what was it like before you started? Were developers just sitting there depressed? And <laughs> uh, we, we did have uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, one of my buddies, Brian. Uh, he was a very quiet engineer, uh, always had his headphones in, always had his sunglasses on, uh, walking in and out of the building. Uh, he's very talented, uh, and, and he's a funny guy, and I always used to talk to him, and I, I was probably pretty annoying to him most days, but uh, he went and did a uh, labs engagement with Pivotal and worked as a uh, in pairing, extreme programming, and really what Brian wanted to do is he wanted to be an engineer. He didn't want to be an admin of another third party tool. He wanted to go out and do engineering. So Brian comes back after six months like a completely different human being, like the one I knew he could. I actually use him as an example uh, when some of the students come in that we talk to uh, because, I mean, we're on a big, uh, my shameless plug, we're on a big hiring uh, <laughs> bonanza right now. So go check us out. Check out <laughs> Brooks at uh, DSG Tech uh, and come work for us. It's not a better time than now. Actually, now, now I have to give everybody else a chance yeah. to block too. <laughs> Listen, you, you, well, I, we'll I do saw that in context. I, was, it's, yeah. Yeah. I, I saw an opportunity. I had to take it. <laughs> Sports, hustle. You yeah. know, <laughs> Aggressiveness. But, but actually what you mentioned, um, for us it was key when hiring people to say, uh, hey, we run on Cloud Foundry. Um, you have the opportunity to try things out. It doesn't take long to get new things started. Um, and that was really like a differentiating factor towards other companies that were also recruiting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you, when you get that opportunity to say, like, we're bringing you in to come and be an engineer and, and do what you do, and we're not going to put this big, uh, all these guide rails around you. We want to see what you can create with our team uh, because you're going to go into this balanced team. You're going to have the ability to think through problems and deliver deliver as fast as possible. I think, it's, I think that is a big recruiting tool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with Cloud Foundry, you can even make a small parts logistics company interesting as a... Yeah, absolutely. And that, that really is a big challenge for us. Mm. Um, it's, uh, as a small company, you can't really play around much. You have to focus on um, getting your projects through and delivering to your customer because the customer is very close usually. Um, and so for us, it's hard to find people that can understand the domain, get a lot of stuff done, and not get stuck into all the myriads of, um, let's say, infrastructure, ops, and all that. And we can achieve that using Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Brian is obviously really happy. He's turned his life around. Sure. Is there, um, do you have any examples? What, what kind of challenges did you run into, or were there issues you ran into? Where your developers said, "Well, maybe I preferred the old way." Or? Uh, I, I think one of the biggest challenges is when you do do a overall cultural shift, like we did at, at Dick Sporting Goods, is people are used to their everyday uh, kind of schedules. They know when they come in, they go to their desk, they do certain things. They know when they go and get their coffee, that type of thing. Uh, when you open up the space and there's a lot more communication and a lot more people are dependent more on each other to get things done. Uh, I think that creates a little bit of fear because anything you want to perform for your teammate, you want to make sure that you're there and you're helping them move the ball forward. Uh, but you also have your set schedule from what you were doing before. So I think one of the challenges was just figuring out how we were going to work together in this new um, collaborative structure. And there, there's some ramp to that. but. But one of the, the great things is like just hearing the buzz now around the office about how passionate our, our teams are about what they're building. And it's because they're collaborating not just within their own team, but they're, they're kind of cross-pollinated around the room just talking through ideas. Yeah, I think for us it's also the, you know, again, I talked a little bit about kind of breaking down the silos and getting the teams to talk, right. which is, you know, an amazing thing once it starts to happen and finding ways to influence and drive the same behaviors across the organization. Um, you know, things like change management and, you know, even some of the security tools that we use, really challenging, you know, audit to come with us rather than to audit us at the end, learn and understand what we're doing right now 
how we're implementing you know, either these new controls or these new policies so that when it comes time to audit, they understand it and we're not you know, waiting until the end. That's been actually really powerful, especially as we brought in our cloud providers as well. Do you find the same thing, Maddie? Uh, well, for us, the challenge in the beginning was um, we knew how the system worked before and what like the security procedures were and all that. And now there was this new platform, Cloud Foundry, and we didn't have any experience with it. So some were actually quite afraid of w what's going to happen. Does it have the same levels? Um, what, what are the procedures to go through if something happens and so on and so forth? So there was a bit of a fear. Um, but over time, of course, we overcome this and now we're quite happy with it. Mm. Um, you guys talked about the culture change. I don't want to belabor that too much because sure. we talk about that all the time. But that is, is difficult to manage. And um, Do you have any tips for people with what worked for you? Yeah. I think for us is to go in, go in it with an open mind. You know, um, I always say to, you know, to people that the, the intent is positive. Don't expect that people are you know, being, you know, negative or standoffish on purpose. Everyone has positive intent when they go into a meeting. Um, some are just being either protective of their teams or protective of the tools that they operate. Um, so really, you know, think about it from the other person's perspective and just, you know, maintain that, that positivity going into it. I think patience is a big key and your ability to kind of listen to, to the people that you're working with, your teammates, and, and and hear what the feedback is about the area. So you have in your mind, you set it up a certain way, and it may have worked for, for another company that you work with, but you may have to adjust things that, that are different in your office. So just listening and, and trying to understand the other person's situation. Working with German engineers. Yeah, working with German <laughs> engineers, but I think it's not much different, though. <laughs> Got it. Um, you brought up, uh, you work with SAP. I think you're, yes. you, you, both of you work with Pivotal, Pivotal. I think, yes. right? Yeah. Um, did any of you consider just building your own and not working with a vendor? So we started, we, we gave it a shot. Uh, uh, we, were, we were pretty aggressive, again, out of the gate. We wanted to uh, kind of go and do, um, uh, and I'm not going to say we, we, we stumbled, but we needed that support, that next, that next level of like, Here's how we do things, and them being able to bring their expertise, not just from a, a technology standpoint, but a, a way of working. I think that was what really helped us. I mean, we've gotten really organized around uh, our rituals and, and, and things that you know Pivotal brought to the table. I know we could go out and read a book and say, you know, this is how Agile works and things like that. But having someone to come in and, and pair with you and, and kind of move you through the process was was really big for us. But we did give it a shot early on. Uh, but having the guardrails there were actually very important to us. What, what happened when you gave it a shot? I mean, we, we got CFO. I mean, it was working uh, in theory. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there, there's some things that you need to talk about, the things you need to go through, scaling. Uh, and my team was all net new. Uh, uh, we had brought people in from different parts of the company, all working on completely different, uh, different items. Uh, one of the guys here, he's in the front row, he, he was in security. He was doing nothing as far as like hands-on keyboard technology. He's come a ton a long way. Like, I mean, we've just had to continuously move people into these new positions and watch them grow, which has been pretty awesome. We started with another vendor prior to Pivotal because um, we started in 2013. Um, Who was that vendor? Staccato. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's been a so while, we, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, right. yeah. So we moved to Pivotal in 2015, and, and really there was a dramatic change in, you know, like Jace talked about, um, that cultural shift and understanding, you know, how we can improve the developer experience through user testing and user research and simply asking the question, what problems are you having? And then bringing the right teams in together to help solve them. And knowing that it was beyond our own organization and we had to start partnering with others. Actually, we did not um, try to build up our own infrastructure, and that is very simple. We just didn't have the know-how or the resources or the time to do so. But um, actually, I, I want to kind of pick up on Abby's um, kayak uh, metaphor because I really liked it. Because in the last two days or so, we have been talking mostly about um, well, that kayak that looks pretty much like a cruise ship to me. 
Yes, they're rapid, <laughs> um, but you're talking about large enterprises, lots of people, shiny things, big apps, and so on and so forth. Um, but think about the rapids when you sit in a little nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, so you need a partner, a big partner, to lean on to and someone that navigates you through those rapids. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why we have chosen SAP, because A, they're close by, um, and, and B, they had the, all the resources, um, the learning, um, the people, and so on and so forth, and the knowledge, uh, most likely, um, to go with that. And, and to have a strong partner helping us navigate through that, and I think that was, well, after all, a good choice. Mm. And with close by, you mean the few towns over? Yeah, a few towns yeah. over. That Location is everything. Location <laughs> <laughs> is everything. It's, it's, uh, time for the other vendors to open up some office in <laughs> southern Germany. I actually, actually, I think pretty much everyone has offices over there, but um, for us it was the good choice. And it, there was one other reason than being close by, and that is um, if you work with a lot of the big enterprise systems, such as the ERP system from SAP, you need the right connectors. Um, and so if, if you have uh, a platform that already offers quite a variety of connectivity, of yeah, connectors, um, then you can start with that and don't have to go through the hassle of building or trying to figure out protocols or that kind sure, of stuff. Sure. And we don't often talk about cloud foundry in the context of small and medium businesses, but it seems to be changing a little bit. Yeah, I think. yeah and, and I really hope that's going to change because um, the simplicity that um, cloud foundry brings to the table is really something that I see big value, especially for medium businesses in. I mean, yes, the scalability and all that stuff we've talked about in the couple of, last couple of days is something for large enterprises, but for medium enterprises, being able to leverage that scalability and being ready when a big wave hits their systems is an awesome thing, yeah. but in this, at the same time, they can go with a smaller environment and still run all their applications on it. So um, to me, it's quite a good platform for those two. The, the problems are all the same, regardless of what size you are. Yeah. I mean, you called out the, we don't know what we needed to buy when it came to hardware. I mean, that the same thing happens anywhere you go. I mean, either you're overbought or you're underbought, and then you're trying to scramble to figure out what to do if you're underbought. Mm -hmm. So with, with having the, the ability to scale on, on demand, uh, that's a big thing from not only a budgetary uh, perspective, because then you can save that money throughout the year, and then you can right size whenever you need to. Yeah. We've been so positive. <laughs> it's, let's go the other way. Uh, what was your biggest misstep in getting started or using Cloud Foundry since you got started? What went wrong? I would say not necessarily what went wrong, but what's been hard okay. for us is um, definitely the idea of at an enterprise level not being able to leverage, and I talked about this a little bit already, but those marketplace services. And really, you know, we've had to abstract the CLI from our developers, except for in the development environment, hmm. because of the inability to really get granular from a rollback model standpoint. Um, so having to, to put those pieces in it that we have to now run and manage, so we've abstracted it into a um, web portal, um, that's difficult because now that's a hurdle that we need to overcome every time we um, move forward with a new version. And so I guess you know, in the interest of um, thinking about Eric's presentation yesterday, um, I would love to see a, a more fine-grained rollback model put into the platform. That would be my ask of the community. Your developers didn't revolt when you took the CLI away? We never them? gave it to them, okay. so they don't even know. They, they don't know what they're missing. <laughs> <laughs> I think our opportunities so far have been around uh, becoming a learning uh, company. So like going from always trying to be perfect to understanding that we're not going to be perfect. I mean, we've had to redo some of our foundations two or three times just basically because our first idea uh, we didn't like once it was done. But the beauty in using something like this is we can repay whenever we want and make those tweaks and adjustments. Uh, I think it was. I think the biggest thing was going a little bit easier on ourselves. Uh, me specifically, I'm, I'm I'm one of those guys who like we got to get this done the right right the first time. Uh, where we're really learning that you know everything that we're doing, we're getting better each each and every time we we roll something out. So I think that's been the biggest challenge or opportunity that we've had. For us, the biggest challenge was really the security part and um, trying to convince um, the operators in the classic uh, IT department um, that what we do is as secure and as good 
as what, what they do. Um, so that, that, that was a challenge, really. I can imagine. I, I, I imagine an insurance company yeah. that and it, even... it continues to be a challenge, you know. And again, that's why I talk about you know bringing your risk management team along with you. You know, you you need to change the way we do things like risk management, change management, um, how we you know define our security policies and standards. It's no longer that you're going to put something out on a wiki and expect our developers are going to go read that. You know, we take on responsibility of enforcing a lot of that through our pipelines, through our development practices. So it's not even something we have to think about anymore. Running short on time here. Um, you've got the whole community here. Yep. What would you like them to do? What do you need from the community? Besides coming to work for you, I know that. <laughs> well, I need that too, so. We'll, we'll get to right? that. Okay. We'll get to that. Yeah. Well, I, I think from my perspective, it's just keep being proactive. And, and doing what you're doing. I mean, we're seeing great things just of, from yesterday's keynote of how Cloud Foundry is growing. I mean, they're being very proactive. They're, they're not waiting back to see how things are going to shift. They're actually going out there and looking at what the new tool sets that are available and trying to bring them in and, and continuously um, build the platform out to be stronger. For us, it's spreading the word about Cloud Foundry and uh, also in, into Asia. Uh, China uh, is an important market for us uh, where we don't see so much uh, Cloud Foundry activity yet um, and also small and medium businesses in which we are in. Yeah. So I'll put another you know, plug in for the role-based access control, but then I also think scalability. You know, I think when we, when, as we start to grow our foundations and you know, we're running in three internal data centers as well as um, three regions in AWS, we sometimes don't know how much more we can push a single foundation before we need to add another. Um, so really understanding kind of what our load looks like across the board. Do you think that in five years you'll still be using Cloud Foundry? I think so. Yeah. All of you? You're, uh, you're, you're smiling. He's like, I'm going to Microsoft. You're like, um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it'll be a flavor of Cloud Foundry. I don't think it'll be what we're, we're, I don't think we'll be talking about it the same way as we do now. So I think it'll just be, uh, the community will grow and move into a different direction, but it'll just be, we'll be talking about something much different, the shift. But I'm sure Cloud Foundry will be involved in that. All right. Awesome. You hiring? Yes, we are hiring. You have a URL? <laughs> look us up online, you'll find it's something. It's hard, it's hard to find you. I tried to look you up. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, we're launching it, a new it, website <laughs> on Cloud Foundry, <laughs> but there are different reasons why it's not. I want to fly. Yeah. <laughs> you get a hashtag. You gotta get a hashtag. That's, oh, yeah, yeah. You have a pluck? Yeah, yeah uh, we are hiring across the board in IT, and it's Tech at Liberty. Okay, and Dix is not hiring, you shouldn't. Oh, we're hiring everywhere. Come join us. Hashtag uh, DSG Tech. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.